It's a pleasure to welcome you all at the Humanitarium. Uh, welcome to uh, the 40 experts who came from all over the world to discuss the history of humanitarian principles, because this event uh, this evening is the public segment of a two-day conference on the history of the fundamental principles of the Red Cross and Red Crescent. So we are very lucky to have uh, here so many experts. And the discussion started this morning. It will continue tomorrow, but we thought that it was uh, necessary to share all these lessons, all this expertise. And so we have also organized this public event in which we'll try to organize this uh, meeting of our experts, of the discussions around the evolution of the principles in time and the larger audience. So we are also very pleased to have in the room the members of the Assembly of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Welcome. And welcome to all of you who are following us uh, here in the room or um, on the internet, because this event uh, is live streamed. So welcome to all. Uh, as you know, uh, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the adoption by the international movement of the Red Cross and Red Crescent of its seven fundamental principles. So they are quite well known. I think uh, in the past event, one of our panelists said we are sitting here in the temple of the principles, possibly, because, of course, the ICRC is well known for its purist approach to the humanitarian principles, to its fundamental principles. So we're talking about the principle of humanity, independence, impartiality, neutrality, also the principle of unity and universality and voluntary service, which are the seven principles common to Red Cross, Red Crescent, national societies, uh, the different components of the international movement of the Red Cross and Red Crescent. In the humanitarian sector at large, we uh, speak about humanitarian principles when we refer to the four first ones. Humanity, impartiality, independence and neutrality. So this year marks this adoption, 50 years of their adoption. Um, and this event, this evening, is the opportunity to look at the history, but going further in the past, we'll look back at the history of the humanitarian uh, action and the evolution of its principles since the origins. Uh, this event is also part of a cycle of a series, a series of, of conversations we've had in the past year around the principles, but this evening is specially devoted to history. And the next event in our cycle will take place in Vienna, where actually the, the seven principles were adopted. So beginning of October, there will be another conference to mark this anniversary. So in order to discuss this issue, we have this evening with us uh, eminent practitioners. Uh, so first, I would like to welcome Jane Cocking, who is the Humanitarian Director at Oxfam UK. Welcome and Peter Moore, who is the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross. I won't give you all the details because you have on your seats the bios of our panelists, so I'll keep it to a minimum and, and won't uh, tell you much more about their career, so you can have all the information uh, on this leaflet. So this evening, uh, they will have the opportunity to discuss this evolution of the humanitarian practice through uh, the practice of, of the fundamental principles, the humanitarian principles at large, uh, and we will have chronological presentations. So we have uh, invited three representatives of our conference to present the challenges that the humanitarian sector faced in different periods of time. So first we will have Professor Irene Hermann from the University of Geneva, who will speak about the early days but well, actually it's a very <laughs> large period of time. I'm sorry we gave you such a long period. So it starts with the early ages of modern humanitarianism in the 1860s up to the end of the Second World War. So quite a long period of time. Then, yeah, yeah uh, a few more words. Then we will discuss the challenges during this time. And then we'll give the, the floor to Professor Andrew Thompson. So now it's time that I, I thank particularly our partner, because this conference would not have been possible without 
our two main partners, and it's Andrew Thompson from the University of Exeter who came uh, with this idea uh, more than a year ago, and we were very enthusiastic to work on this project. So we'd like to thank you and thank the University of Exeter and uh, the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council, uh, without uh, whom we could not, without which we could not organize this event. So thank you very much, Andrew. So we'll discuss with Andrew the challenges of decolonization and Cold War, and then we'll reach um, uh, the present time, and then uh, we will give the floor to Mike Aronson, who will then present uh, what we have called the age of liberal interventionism from the end of the Cold War up to 2005, and we'll open the discussion to the audience. Let me say a few words to set the scene for this conversation, because it's a very rich history, and there are many, many dimensions we could discuss, and these issues have been discussed by the international sector at large for many years. So I would suggest to highlight two main dimensions in our conversation, and in order to guide you through the discussions, I'll try to follow these two dimensions. First, we will look at the principles as tools, tools for humanitarian actors to navigate in very difficult environments, in crises, in conflicts, and tools to make difficult choices. So we'll look at them and we'll ask ourselves some questions related to the effectiveness of applying these principles. Does it work? Does it make a difference to people? What are the best practices? What are the lessons learned in terms of application of the principles? And then the second dimension is to look at the principles as a catalyst of the identity of the humanitarian sector. Somehow the principles have defined the boundaries of the humanitarian sector, defining what is humanitarian, what is not. And sometimes we've had, within the sector, discussions on definitions, interpretations. We have also seen many interpretations across different cultures or religions. And we've seen the humanitarian sector evolve a lot. First, it brought the principles out of its own practice. And second, the principles, once when they were formalized, shaped the sector itself. And so we will look at this evolution and discuss also the identity dimension. So, thank you for your attention. And now I'd like to give you the floor. Thank you, Professor Herman. Welcome. Let's start this uh, conversation. So what did you pick and what question would you like to, to tackle? Maybe uh, Jane or Peter would like to start. It is first. Okay. Well, thank you, Irene. That was the most extraordinary encapsulation of, of some of the greatest challenges that we face. Um, I'd like to pick up on your first question. Is the history um, a burden or a, or a blessing? And I think we have a choice. I, I genuinely do. Because we can either choose to embrace and to learn from history and to hold our identity, or we can choose to grow from it. And speaking from Oxfam's point of view, um, and this touches on your, your other question, when, your next question as well, about how we see neutrality, independence, and so on. Um, we do not have either the burden or the blessing of, unlike the ICRC, of being the custodians of the principles. And so we have a choice in terms of how we behave in a way which really embraces what we see the core, the core principle for all of us as humanitarians being, which is humanity. And so, from an Oxfam point of view, if I can put it this way, historically, uh, our origins in 1942 were not only as a group of people offering humanitarian assistance in Greece, but also challenging the underlying causes of the Great Famine of the winter of 1941-42, which my predecessors saw very clearly as being the Allied blockade of Greece. And in an act of either incredible boldness or abject treachery, you can take your choice, they chose to do both. 
And so that's the history that we come from. And so we're coming from a history almost of rejecting a principle at the same time as embracing the others. And so, you know, we pay tribute to, to Mrs. Ogata when she was... Um, when she was a uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, when she said, I think, very uh, precisely, um, there are no humanitarian solutions to humanitarian problems. We would add to that there are only political solutions. And so in a world where crisis and, and <coughs> disaster are only expanding, we feel we have to really embrace what is going on and, and how we address that in the long term, not only in its, in, its, in its manifestations. And so I lay that out as a rather controversial statement, perhaps, but something to, to get us going. And Peter, I would love to know what you, in a very different position, feel about that. And if, if I can just push you even a little further um, to give you a concrete example to, to respond to, as well as Irene's question. Um, where I sit, we all admire the ICRC enormously for many, many things. Um, but one thing that uh, my own chief executive has written about very recently was the way in which you uh, embraced and championed the campaign against landmines in the 1990s. And would you still do that? Because for us, that is a real challenge to how we embrace neutrality, but uh, something that we would love to see you do more of. What do you think? Thanks a lot, uh, <laughs> Jane and Irene. Uh, maybe just the, the line I would take on asset and burden is, uh, is to say, well, it's destiny for us. <laughs> history, and uh, I would share uh, your view, Jane, that we have to embrace history and to see what it tells us. What I was told by Irene in the last five minutes is basically that principles did not fall from, he from heaven, as prefixed product produced somewhere, uh, but it has been an evolution of an organization responding to real problems. The real problem of acceptance, the real problem of uh, having access, the real problems of intercultural understandings from the different contexts in which we were active. And so I think your encapsulation from the principle is a good reminder that those principles are not prefixed. And what I can learn from that kind of history and in embracing History of the ICRC with regard to the principles is basically that you have to reconstitute the consensus around the principles and the meaning of the principles and you have to redefine it in each and every context and each and every period in which you are active. And this is what our past tells us at the end of the day. It's not an ideological fixed product or a or a well thought through product which is fixed, but it is rather a sort of task to future generations to each and every situation, context and period to reflect what do the principle tell us with regard to our actions, activities, challenges, dilemmas with which we are confronted. And I think this is a way of looking at history which allows us to embrace history and to look at how did we do it in the past, what, in how far were the, the principles useful in order to carve out a space for humanity, how did it support our operations, and I think it's an interesting history, uh, the decades that you, uh, that you have uh, summarized. I wouldn't contest, Jane, the, uh, that there are no humanitarian solutions to humanitarian problems. I have said it many times in the recent past, that there are only political solutions to humanitarian problems. And then the question is, who is responsible for the one or for the other? And what is our 
role and burden sharing and what is our understanding as humanitarians and what is our task to advocate with politicians to drive the car of political institutions and projects and problems uh, as we perceive them as humanitarians. So we don't think that uh, when you say that there are only political problems to humanitarian issues that necessarily we have to find the political solutions to the humanitarian problems. There are political institutions to find those solutions, but I would not take a conservative line in a sense that therefore we have just to look at our garden of humanitarian action, but I think we have a responsibility to bridge the gap between the experience and knowledge and the problems that we experience on the ground through our work and to bring it into the political arena. That what is what we have done with landmines. That's what we do with nuclear weapons. That's what we do with a lot of other projects. to move political agenda without debating them in the public space. Uh, that's the advantage of confidentiality and of the methodology. And then, of course, I come to uh, Irene's dilemma of the genocide. But here, again, I would agree with what you said. It's outside humanitarianism. And then the question is, how do you bridge the gap when you know and politicians are asked to act? And I think we have said in the past, and we have an event this year already here with regard to the 70 years of the liberation of the concentration camp, that uh, this was not good transmission of our field experience into political decision making, what we have done in the Second World War. Uh, because it would have been possible to advocate earlier uh, in the way with, with what we knew. So the question on the, on the lessons learned here is again, it's not so much there is an area out there which is uncontestably far away from principled humanitarian action and is out of the area of influence of any humanitarian actor. And then you have to, so how do you bridge the gap now? What do you say? In what format do you advocate for what you see? What do you recommend? And what are the channels of communication you find with the political decision makers? And this is a big issue. You know that I have advocated strongly and, uh, uh, for a more proactive humanitarian diplomacy of this organization in order to be better in a position to more broadly communicate and to use transmittance of basic field experience to political decision making. And maybe just to perhaps conclude, because I imagine you might like to, to move on, um, to come back to the first question you posed about burden or, or blessing. I think one of the things I have found most energizing about the very open discussion of the principles today has been the, the consensus that unless we are really wrestling with the principles and unless we are almost crashing up against them in, in, in our day-to-day -day work, then we are not, we're not using them as our forebears intended them to be, but also we are not pushing ourselves enough as humanitarians to really make sure that we can be the best we can be. I think to come to you, uh, Irene's third point, I'm, uh, I'm quite enthusiastic about the concept of fluidity. Uh, recognizing that those principles are not well defined and taking it as a task to continuously try to shape consensus around the concrete meaning in concrete contexts in order to inform action. That is where we are. We can just preach principles. Preaching principles uh, and defining them is not producing any result. It's basically a task to each and every generation, each and every context and each and every uh, situation, not to overestimate the definitional character of principles, but to take it as a task to 
create consensus on the concrete meaning. That's what we try to do in Syria, in Yemen, in many other contexts, uh, in which it is very difficult to unfold principled humanitarian action today. Thank you. Um, we may come back to the, the political dimensions of the negotiations around the, the ban of uh, landmines, because I see we've been joined by Cornelio Somaruga, uh, who was president of the ICRC at the time of the Ottawa Treaty. So thank you for coming to our events regularly. Um, so, but before that, um, I suggest we now give the floor to Andrew Thompson, um, who will um, then uh, uh, give us the same broad picture of the um, period starting at the end of the Second World War, the decolonization and Cold War. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, so I've been asked to deal with the period of decolonization and the Cold War. Um, in the decades after the Second World War, humanitarian very much developed at the intersection of three geopolitical forces, decolonization and the Cold War, but also new forms of globalization. Decolonization was about much more than the ending of colonial relationships. What was at stake was the dismantling of an entire global order. An old world of imperial states was replaced by a new world of nation states, and that in turn ushered in new patterns of cultural, political, and economic relations. In the existential struggle that was the Cold War, the control of overseas territory mattered intensely to each side's sense of security and power. Capitalist West and Socialist East competed to convince nearly a newly independent African and Asian states to adopt their models of, of humanitarian and development aid. And as a result, it became more difficult to distinguish between aid given according to state interests and that given according to recipient needs. Globalization, meanwhile, expanded the range of voices that humanitarians had to listen to, but it also radically differentiated them. Aid agencies intensified their use of the international media, and as a result of that, they were exposed to greater pressures from the donor states and donor publics. So those three geopolitical forces, decolonization, the Cold War, and globalization, raised far-reaching questions about the relationship of international organizations and NGOs to state power, about the basis upon which humanitarian needs were identified and prioritized, and about the interaction of humanitarians with non-state armed groups. And in the midst of this period, as humanitarianism reorientated itself away from a war-torn Europe towards the global south, the significance of the fundamental principles was magnified. They were formally adopted, as Van Sanne said, at the 20th International Conference of the Red Cross in Vienna in 1965, as a statement of the movement's ethics and values, as well as its purpose and goals. I think various challenges arose out of this new geopolitical environment. Humanitarians were faced with many situations for which they were ill-prepared and in which they therefore had to improvise. New types of armed struggle involved Europe's colonial powers fighting an array of non-state armed groups. Unconventional and asymmetric forms of warfare placed a premium on establishing authority and control over civilian populations and revolved and decolonizations wars often revolved as much indeed around the territory uh, control of people as the control of territory. Distinctions between combatants and non-combatants were blurred in the midst of violent struggles to reorder the human landscape. And in many cases, these late colonial and post-colonial conflicts were hydra-headed. They were entangled with superpower rivalries. And as a result, the very term humanitarianism was to be used in a much more inflationary way. There are intense arguments about what types of victims should be brought within its ambit. Should, for example, the rules governing the treatment of POWs extend to members of anti-colonial, revolutionary and liberation movements, even if they didn't wear uniforms and lived as civilians when they weren't engaged in military operations? Should those fleeing colonial and Cold War conflicts be treated as refugees, even if they might once have been fighters and indeed become fighters again? Should assistance be provided to militarized refugee camps if it meant helping those taking part in armed activity in their own country? Should those detained by their own states under emergency legislation be distinguished from those convicted of ordinary criminal offenses? In many ways, I think the fundamental principles in this post-war period provided a way of framing a debate 
about what kinds of help and support humanitarians could legitimately provide, in which situations they provide, could provide it, and to whom they could provide it. And new brands of humanitarian action also emerged, including the expansion, of course, of the Red Cross Red Crescent movement, but also the growth of NGOs in the global south. The previous social contract of humanitarian action, whereby Western states and Western international organizations and NGOs came together to agree the basis of hum humanitarian policy and practice, began to fall apart. I'd like to venture that there were perhaps three possible insights that we might draw from this period. The first is that the crafting of compromise is integral rather than antithetical to a principled approach. During decolonization, constraints were a constant. They couldn't be evaded. So the real challenge for humanitarians wasn't to avoid any form of compromise with state authority, but to work out when compromised descended into collusion. Humanitarian principles expressed lofty ideals, but were they also operationally relevant? Did they provide a basis for taking difficult decisions about how to limit cooperation with state and non-state armed groups to that that was really necessary for humanitarian purposes? Secondly, I think fidelity to any form of humanitarian principles was always predicated on an understanding of the political frameworks and processes into which humanitarians had to insert themselves. During this period, Red Cross and other aid workers frequently found themselves embedded in conflicts in which their principal weapon was perhaps not just their perceived neutrality or impartiality, but their ability to interpret events. And seeing the bigger picture, of course, wasn't always easy from the field, but a failure to do so pre prevented humanitarians from grasping the likely consequences of their actions. And thirdly, I think the fundamental principles played a pivotal role in securing acceptance of types of humanitarian assistance that were poorly provided for in terms of international law. Non-international armed conflict was the most prevalent form of conflict during decolonization and the Cold War. And Jean Pictet spoke forcefully at the time of the danger of a humanitarian's no-man's land emerging. I think that was particularly true for political detainees. A quiet revolution in the visiting of political detainees nonetheless occurred after 1945, and it relied heavily on the principles of independence, neutrality, and impartiality for its justification. Without the fundamental principles, it's far from clear to me the ICRC could have pursued the protection of political detainees as determinedly as it did. And I think that shows how humanitarian principles can, at times at least, provide a basis or grounding for humanitarian action when legal instruments don't necessarily provide everything that's required. So are there any parallels with that situation today? Well, this, above all, was a period of what was called at the time revolutionary and counterinsurgency warfare, in many ways not entirely unlike that we've witnessed more recently in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. So the questions I want to leave the panel with are as follows. Firstly, and perhaps most obviously, how may humanitarian principles help to counter the instrumentalization and indeed hyper-politicization of aid for foreign policy or other interests? In crisis situations where state parties to conflict, non-state armed groups, and sometimes even aid workers are intensively politicized, what scope is there for a principled humanitarian approach? Europe's colonial powers and Cold War powers were certainly not averse to presenting their own actions in counterinsurgencies in humanitarian terms. And that was especially true of policies of forced resettlement or relocation, which were driven by security considerations but claimed to protect innocent civilians. Can humanitarian principles help staff in the field to navigate the moral hazards that present themselves in such situations? And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the categorization of conflict and the naming of violence were as important during this post-war period as they have been in more recent conflicts. Europe's colonial powers labelled insurgents as terrorists to render them less human or subhuman, and even perhaps to place them beyond a humanitarian pale. What role can the principles play in mobilising the empathy and solidarity necessary to prevent some victims being seen as more deserving, others as less deserving, and some perhaps not deserving at all? Is it humanity that's the most essential and inspirational principle of all the principles, the most fundamental of all the fundamental principles, the one with the greatest capacity to counter violently opposed interests that characterise so-called wars on terror? If so, 
What do we do when understandings of humanity are distorted or perverted, as they were during this post-war period, by those who link the concept of humanity to hierarchies of civilization and to a deeply damaging belief that racial principles could be a cornerstone of the social and political order? In essence, what happens when a sense of shared humanity is distinctly lacking? Uh, to see uh, how both of you, Professor Erman and, and Andrew Thompson, you managed to, to capture all these issues. And it was a difficult task to go fast forward uh, throughout more than a century of history of humanitarian action. So thank you very much. And indeed, many elements that you uh, said, armed groups, mostly non-international armed conflicts, counterinsurgency, I mean, uh, sound very familiar. Uh, so I'm sure we can draw lots of parallels to what we see today. So who would like to, to take s the questions of Andrew Thompson? Well, Andrew, I, I would also recognize a lot of present in your description of the past, in a sense that what we probably witness over time is that warfare is never a period for particular tolerance and has never been. And instrumental instrumentalization of who, whatever actors uh, of society is, is elementary to warfare. But what we have seen is that the, the, the sort of all-encompassing warfare the outreach and instrumentalization of each and every part of society, including humanitarian action and activity, has been almost an unbroken trend in the 20th century and up till now. If we look at 19th and beginning of 20th century warfare these left spaces which did not touch civilians or did not touch certain areas of societies. I would say the quality of communicative skills of statecraft, of military development, of technological development has made conflicts increasingly totalitarian. And humanitarians have been part of the trend of being instrumentalized uh, in, in conflict. This is very clear. One of the indicators for us is that the whole issue of Article 3 of the Gene common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions and talking about parties to conflict is today and has been over decades already a contested article. While it is in, in law and we reference to it, we have continuously the, the sort of suspicion that at the end of the day, we are legitimizing while the Article 3 said without, uh, uh, without prejudice to recognition. So I think it crisp the, the sort of more totalitarian warfare, instrumentalization of humanitarian crystallizes for us around the legitimacy or not to engage with everybody and all sides, which again is absolutely crucial to create a humanitarian space ruled by humanitarian principles. If there is no space, there is no space for principles. If there is not, in terms of ideology, and concept, at least the recognition that on the other side there are humans as well, there is no space for humanity. And so, conceptually, we are concerned that we see this trend reinforced. And then, of course, what do you do? And here I would uh, strike a slightly more optimistic tone. What surprises me over the decades at ICRC is the relentless ability to negotiate that space, even if conceptually it's not offered and given. And I think that is what we have done over the last 70 years. 
in particularly non-international armed conflict, not to accept that there is no space, and then try to engage as good as we can. And the principles have been terribly useful to offer an, a space of legitimacy at the end of the day, have given us a basis of effective humanitarian assistance which has found some recognition on both sides or on all sides of the front line because there are not any more two sides only, on all sides of front lines and therefore the principles have been absolutely crucial to create the space for which they were designed for. And I think I would say that this situation continues to today. We need to create each and every time and each and every situation the space where principles can basically be implemented, can be concretized. And this is what ICRC delegates do in the field, negotiate the operational arrangements which allow us a minimal space of humanity. Complicated, increasingly complicated, but possible. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. And I always tie this to, 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 to sort of tongue-in-cheek to our budget. Uh, we have increased our budget by 50% in the last three years, which was a bonanza of instrumentalization in international conflicts. But this is at the same time a recognition that we are able to deliver neutral and impartial and independent humanitarian action and to negotiate a space for it. I, I agree with most of what you've said, Peter, but I'm going to um, answer Andrew's question as well as I can, but then end by posing one back to you, um, which is in answer to your first question. Um, the language that the principles give us uh, is a language that means, of course, if we are speaking principle ease, then we are in the territory of compromise and negotiation. Otherwise, we could just write it down and say, right, this is it. Are you going to buy into this? And if the answer is anything other than a, a you know, rousing yes, please, then that is the end of the conversation. So by definition, principles have to be that so that tool by which we, we negotiate space. And reflecting back on the history that you gave us, as I look back into the history of my own organisation and, and many like it, um, I think there's no doubt we came through a period which was during the one you've described, where... The, the idea of solidarity um, with particular movements um, was one of the, the core ways of working. And still, it's, it's fascinating to listen. We have a, an annual event uh, where we sort of reflect on history and invite all sorts of people to come. And uh, it's fascinating to hear people talk about the period you gave us what they are proud of and what they are not. And essentially, the work that Oxfam was doing in South Africa under apartheid, which was very low-key and cross-border and, and is, is some of the, the, the core of the organization's soul still. But it's, 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 it's in the territory of solidarity rather than, rather than principled humanitarian action. Would we do that again? Some of my older predecessors on an annual basis lambast me that we wouldn't. I explain why we wouldn't do it in that way, which takes us back into much more the territory that you're talking about, Peter, which is the use of principles as that creator of space so that common humanity can be recognised and, where possible, flourish. But my question, and it's a genuine question, it's, 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 uh, not a, it's not a question that I know the answer to at all, but what do you do when 
you are speaking a language which, despite your very best efforts, the, at least one group or party with whom you are aiming to speak simply do not embrace that. Simply, you cannot find that chink to actually keep that conversation going. Well, basically, what you what you do is try another way. Uh, mm. I mean, there is no much alternative at the end of the day. Yeah, then uh, when you fail on one way, you try another. And if it's not possible to remain credibly consistent in operational arrangement to negotiate spaces, you don't do it. And I recognize that these are difficult choices. I mean, we had many of those difficult choices in the last couple of years in, in the Syrian context. What do you do when you are not able to negotiate an evacuation agreement for people caught in between front lines? And if you don't have the assurance that when they come out of besieged areas, they are treated humanely. If you are caught in that situation and you don't have a satisfactory agreement, you don't conclude the agreement. But then when, what do you do when the government calls you up the next morning and say, care for those people who came out? It's important dilemma. You can't really have a clear-cut and uncontextual response to the question. All responses have to be contextual and have to ponder. The advantage of engagement and the advantage of operational arrangements to deliver humanitarian assistance and protection work compared to the disadvantage of moving away from what your ideal is. And that's what we do each and every day. And then you have to take a decision at the end of the day whether this is the best possible deal you can have at the present moment and enter into it or not enter into it and risk that certain humanitarian activities are not able to perform in, a, in, in, in the circumstances you are. You come to the limits of where you are, and then political action is asked. And all, I suppose, I would add from our perspective, being in a very different position to, to that of ICRC delegates, is this is where we would again come back to our menu of options of which campaigning, advocacy, and influencing is, is one of them. And on some very rare occasions, we would take a decision to pull back from that direct action and invest in other means of, of addressing the crisis. Which we agree is on influencing. Mm. Uh, that's what we both do. Sure. Uh, we may ways. disagree on when exactly yeah. the campaigning part comes to fruition, yeah. in particular in concrete circumstances, mm -hmm. because then we would ponder the advantage of campaign against the disadvantage of losing operational surface yeah. and agreements that we, uh, that we have. That's the classical so uh, we, dilemma yeah. in which we are. But of course, it's, it is also true. I mean, the closer you are around front lines and conflicts and people and perpetrators of violence, the more you are trapped with regard to those difficult dilemmas with which you are confronted. And here, of course, comes my plea for complementarity. Not everybody has to do the same thing. There are those who are very close. And we have committed to be an organization really committed to proximity. Proximity to conflict as close as possible as ever we can to victims and perpetrators. And this limits other arts, other, pos yeah. other domains of possible political action like big advocacy campaign in concrete contexts. 
because then you have to ponder uh, your operational surface towards uh, the campaign. But, I mean, we should be very strategic and relaxed. Others can do, other can set priorities different. The important thing is, uh, and here I would make a plea to humanitarians, sometimes I have the impression that we are fighting over these complementarities as uh, warring parties fight over territory, uh, people and resources. And, and that's not an intelligent way to pass our times as humanitarians. I think each and every one of us has a different mix on operational priorities and how to deliver on the ground and how to deliver humanitarian assistance. And we don't need necessarily to come to exactly the same hier hierarchy of problems, of approaches, of principles uh, in each and every case. Thank you. So I suggest now we, we give the floor to, to Mike Aronson. So we're now moving to, towards the present. Um, so Mike is also very well known in, in Geneva because you, you've been a, uh, you're a founder, founder member of the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. Um, and now you are a fellow in the Department of Politics at the University of Surrey. So welcome, Mike. Oh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you all. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Although I sort of feel it's all been said, really. Um, and you know, maybe the lesson of that is it doesn't really matter which historical period you're talking about. Fundamentally, <laughs> the issues are the same. So I, I think I could paraphrase what I wanted to say, which, which has already been said, very simply by saying it's the humanity, stupid. You know, really, this is what it's all about. It, 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 it is about, is there a shared sense of humanity without which humanitarian action cannot be effective, without which the legitimacy of those of us trying to carry it out is called into question? And that rests on a, on a consensus um, that is actually not the responsibility of organisations like ours, although the ICRC obviously does have a particular responsibility, um, it's actually a responsibility of everybody. So you know, here we are uh, sitting debating the humanitarian principles, which are absolutely splendid and from a purely personal point of view have, have been my guiding light throughout my professional life and I, I have absolutely no doubt of their value and their importance. But actually, the real problems are somewhere else. So that was where I was going to conclude. Um, but I suppose I'd better just say a few other things just to be fair to my period of history. Although I think we've sort of leapt into the future and come back to the past. So, but I'm really covering the period, let's say, from the end of the Cold War to um, about 2005. And I'm speaking more as a practitioner uh, than as an academic. I'm speaking as somebody who spent 20 years of his career wa working for Save the Children UK, uh, uh, which I left in 2005. So you know, I think that period actually was a very challenging period and difficult period for humanitarianism. Um, I, I think the two main things were the, the impact of the end of the Cold War, the, 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 the fact that the political space, especially in Africa, was no longer contested in the same way by the superpowers, which just opened up a lot of other forces um, uh, and created a new set of um, problems for which we perhaps were not as well prepared. And in particular, this concept that many of, many of you will be familiar with of, of complex emergencies, which are really a combination of natural and man-made causes um, and where actually the solution, as Mrs. Ogata said, is own, can only be political. So that was her point, you know. But what happened a lot was that humanitarian action was actually used as a proxy for political action. And so aid agencies found themselves struggling to try to, to be effective in the absence of, uh, of an effective uh, political engagement. And I, there are many examples which I won't, I won't go into. Also, as one of our... Um, papers tomorrow, I should say that I'm speaking about uh, two panels that haven't yet taken place yet. I mean, this is tomorrow's meeting. But as one of our papers for tomorrow uh, 
refers rather elegantly to the confluence of hegemonic power and humanitarian aid. Um, so in other words, if this was a unipolar moment at the end of the Cold War, it was unipolar from a humanitarian point of view as well as a political point of view. So it was the West that was doing things. And the second major element, I think, was this growing doctrine of uh, uh, so-called humanitarian intervention. And I, I make no apologies for calling it so-called because I, I think it's a very misleading term. I'm very critical of academics and practitioners and particularly politicians who use it uncritically. I think its use has been very damaging. Um, but of course, what it was referring to was uh, coercive, essentially military intervention for uh, a, 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 an ostensibly uh, or perhaps more kindly, partially humanitarian purpose. But of course, it only happened in those places where the West's interests were threatened uh, or where there was a major humanitarian crisis on our doorstep. So we saw interventions in northern Iraq, Bosnia, Kosovo, or occasionally where there was a rather naive belief in the efficacy of military action. And sometimes it worked. It worked in Sierra Leone, and sometimes it failed. It failed disastrously in Somalia. Um, and of course, in parallel, there was lack of action of any kind with regard to some of the biggest humanitarian disasters of our era, most notably the genocide in Rwanda. And to a certain extent, that led that to a positive development with the development of the uh, International Commission of Intervention State Sovereignty's report on the responsibility to protect and new, fresh attempts to try to find ways of, of justifying intervention for humanitarian purposes. Um, but then, of course, we had the disaster of 9-11 uh, and the changing of the paradigm uh, and the, the, what I would regard as the subsequent twin tragedies for humanitarianism of, of Afghanistan followed by Iraq, um, which which led to an increasing blurring of the boundaries, I think even more than in the colonial period that Andrew was talking about, an increasing blurring of the boundaries between the, the political, the military, and the humanitarian. And indeed, that blurring was encouraged by some politicians, most notably Tony Blair, who at the time of the um, uh, invasion of Afghanistan talked about this, we have a humanitarian coalition, and saw us all pulling together, all working to deliver the same outcome. And then, uh, again, rather unforgettably, Colin Powell uh, paying tribute to American NGOs, uh, saying how grateful he was to, to, to them. They are our force multipliers. They will allow us to uh, increase our, our impact. So this was, this was uh, it, making it increasingly difficult for uh, us, uh, international NGOs, other humanitarian organizations, to be seen as neutral and independent. And I think, I mean, I would like to say that during this difficult time, I think we've all looked to the ICRC as the, as the beacon and as really the only point, uh, the only fixed point that one can uh, hope will we'll be able to stand firm and, and be the guardian of, of, of the principles and what we hold dear. But of course, even the ICRC uh, was affected often with tragic consequences by these, by these swirling currents. I just want to touch briefly on how did the international NGO community respond to this, and, 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 and this will lead into some questions for Jane and for Peter. I, I mean, again, three main trends perhaps. First, what was labelled, again, I'm not sure how helpfully, um, the new humanitarianism. Uh, in other words, a more consequentialist approach to intervention, uh, maybe uh, uh, attenuating what what might have been a what might have been an, an uninhibited humanitarian response by thinking more about some of the consequences. Um, secondly, a drive towards greater professionalism and accountability. Um, the NGO Red Cross Code of Conduct, the Sphere Project, uh, Accountability Project, and and things like that. But then the third one, which I, I, is the one I want to sort of come back to, which is, a, a, to a certain extent, a pulling up of the drawbridge um, by so-called humanitarians. And in fact, again, a couple of papers tomorrow, we have one, one refers to humanitarian uh, exceptionalism, uh, and the other re re refers to the self-identification of aid-providing entities. You know, we define the territory. We say, we are the humanitarians, you are not. Uh, you can't do certain things, we can. Uh, and I think that's a very um, dangerous approach, which I, which I will say, uh, which I will come back to in, in posing my questions. So I have, 
I have four questions, and then I have a big fifth question, which you've already answered twice, so I'll, I'll still ask it for a third time. Um, the four questions are, firstly, what, what damage did this bundling, this progressive bundling by Western political leaders during the 90s and 2000s of humanitarian, political and military objectives do to the integrity and, and legitimacy of humanitarian action? Has this caused permanent damage to our cause or uh, to the concept of neutral, independent humanitarian action, or can the lost ground be recovered? So that's my first question. Now, for the second question, uh, again, you know, have so-called humanitarian actors damaged their own cause by insisting on their own exclusive right to carry out humanitarian action? And in fact, if you think about it conceptually, there are no humanitarian actors. There are only humanitarian actions. You know, it's, uh, humanitarian is defined by a particular kind of action. And a soldier can be a humanitarian. In fact, a soldier is required to be a humanitarian by international humanitarian law. Anyone can be a humanitarian. It's not a sort of chasse réservée for, you know, people like us. So actually insisting on the obligation on everybody to be a humanitarian, I would argue, is more... Uh, it's a better strategy than, than insisting on my right to be a humanitarian and not yours. Um, so, you know, are we missing something? Are, is, there, is, there, is, there a, is there scope for a different kind of coalition, if you like, a different kind of coalition of humanitarians which, which goes more widely than traditionally? Then the professionalization um, and the drive for greater accountability, has it actually helped? It led to some quite difficult ideological disagreements within the international NGO world with, with some organizations saying they didn't like this development, they thought it did, diverted from the basic principle of humanity um, uh, and, you know, uh, those differences to a certain extent are still around. So has, it, has that helped or not? Is that, is that part of the future or is it something we should revisit? Um, and finally, uh, does, uh, has the traditional so-called humanitarian community which consist, has consisted mainly of Western-based organizations, has it sufficiently understood the need to embrace other actors from different geographies and traditions if the legitimacy of humanitarian action is to be maintained? You know, are we still too much of a close-knit club of the usual suspects? Have we really managed to reach out and embrace the, the other actors from different geographies, different traditions that we need to? So those were my four questions. And then, you know, I, as I was thinking about these questions, I thought, well, actually, there is a much bigger question than all of this, which is that um, you, can't, you, you can't put the humanitarian principles on a pedestal. I think to sort of stick them up there and admire them and polish them occasionally and think, oh, isn't it wonderful that we've got them, is very counterproductive. And as Peter said before, look, you know, they are there as a guide. They are really important, but you have to take them. You have to look at how you're going to use them in any, particular con in any particular context. And the point is you can't look at them in isolation. Um, the legitimacy of humanitarian action rests on a, a consensus that it is morally desirable and that it should be supported. And if that consensus is not present, talk of the principles is actually irrelevant. You can't have lofty discussions about how can you operationalize the principles if you don't have a consensus in global society uh, uh, about, uh, uh, about, about the importance of the principle of humanity. So just as trustworthiness is a necessary condition for trust, you can't achieve it by imposing more regulatory controls on people so they'll, they'll be more trusted. So respect for humanity is a necessary condition for the practice of humanitarianism. And that's a political agenda. Um, uh, I think the tragedy in Syria exemplifies it very well. It took the Security Council three and a half years to pass a resolution that remotely referred to humanitarian principles. It, 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 it founded on all sorts of failed political resolutions. It didn't once focus on the humanitarian dimension, really. Um, and on the ground, of course, um, the lack of, uh, more or less complete lack of respect for human rights is all too apparent. So it's still the case that Mrs. Agata is still right, and it's still the case that humanitarian action cannot be a substitute for political action. So the final question really is, you know, is this a singular moment and a rather ominous one, or can we be at all optimistic about the future? You've sort of answered it already, Peter, but I'd love to hear you on it again. <laughs> no, thank you, Mike. Please join us. Andrew, Professor Amman, you can join us as well. 
Um, so now um, we'd like to answer to this and, and um, sh very briefly so that we can mm -hmm. then um, ask for, for questions from the audience. Thank you. Well, I am not a political historian, and so I, but I find Mike's first question about whether or not uh, the search for an ideology in the early 1990s has permanently damaged humanitarianism fascinating, not least because I spent the majority of my professional life during the 1990s somewhere either in Somalia or the Balkans. Um, and I think from that perspective, if no other, the answer is probably yes. And I think that still informs a great deal of our search and our elucidation of humanitarianism now and the direct link across to the absence of trust um, is as striking now as I recall it being in Somalia in 1993 or, or whenever it all really kicked off there. Um, and that's deeply, deeply depressing. But is there... Is there hope? Well, I think I would agree with you that uh, the pulling up of the humanitarian drawbridge, the sort of this is us and, and this is sacrosanct because principled humanitarian action is good humanitarian action and anything else doesn't work, I think was a, 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 ref a, a defensive reflex, um, but a very understandable one. And to, I'm trying to answer all these questions very quickly in one <laughs> sentence. Can anybody carry out a humanitarian action or do you have to have some specialness to be a humanitarian actor? As an individual, yes, that is our common humanity, isn't it? But does the perception of that uh, alter the nature of the gesture? Yes, it also does, you know. I recall having conversations in Afghanistan in 2002, 2003 with the British Army where they were sending out people in civilian clothes and unmarked land cruisers and just saying, you know, these very well-meaning sort of, we, we are here on a political humanitarian agenda. No, you can't be. Will you please put your uniforms back on and do everybody a favour? Um, so I think that's, that's the answer on that one. The, the, the cause for optimism... Um, I think we have an opportunity, I really do, um, because if we can be strong enough to let go and to allow uh, new initiatives like the core humanitarian standard, which I would not sure what the ICRC's perspective is on that exactly, but it is an opportunity to take the sector forward in a way that is empowering and not exclusive. But I think it's going to take a lot of brave letting go from many of us to enable that to happen in the next 10 years. Peter? <coughs> uh, as uh, time is short, it's obvious that the blurring of uh, the borders is an enormous problem and remains an enormous problem. Is it, is it reversible? I don't know. Nothing in history is re really reversible, but history takes surprising turns. So uh, let's see what kind of terms. But I think today it's one of the big issues with, uh, that we are coping with. And it leads us also to be more scrupulous in defending neutral and impartial humanitarian action as distinct from development, uh, human rights, peacekeeping and other transformational agendas which are highly political. And to see how we manage donor expectations at the same time for more integrated, coherent, uh, hooked up humanitarian action with other areas uh, of political and donor activity. So it's a challenge to manage, but I'm convinced that only in sort of remaining clearly distinct and separate from political action 
that we can reconstitute consensus around humanitarian action which is lacking in many parts of the world at the present moment. So one or two steps back may be important in terms of uh, what exactly humanitarianism is and I would agree Mike that humanitarians are responsible by as well by ex extending the definition of what humanitarian is and attaching aspirational and transformational agenda which never in the history of humanitarianism have really been part of core humanitarian action. The second point with regard to the professionalism, I would just uh, like to give an example which uh, uh, underlines the interesting thought you have done that each and every one for us is a humanitarian and this is not reserved to the profession. Uh, I found it very interesting uh, over the last couple of days to, th to see that in a small European country, not to name here, on the web 13,500 people have declared themselves voluntary to take a refugee home while the government has said and the humanitarian professionals have said that the maximum of 50 would be acceptable in the country. So uh, the reality is that uh, in today's world of connectivity we see a new form of humanitarianism emerge where individuals are empowered and that's the positive news. I mean, we all know about the negative part of atomization, fragmentation and disintegration of our societies. But the positive part is that it has a history of empowerment and the empowerment touches humanitarianism as well. And, and then, of course, uh, I, I, I praise a movement which I very often in my day-to-day -day life criticize. But I think the Red Cross and the Red Crescent movement at the, at the end of the day is an interesting embodiment of professionalism and voluntarism. And in that sense, prefigures maybe a new form of humanitarianism which is much broader than just professional and organizational. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike, for the, the questions you raised. And they managed to answer to all your questions. Uh, so that was um, quite an achievement. Uh, so now I'd like to take a few questions. So please, um, uh, just one question per person, please. And you can um, announce who you are. Um, and please don't make too long comments, uh, as we would like to give the opportunity to have as many questions as possible. Uh, so. I see this lady here, and then, yes, sir, with the... It's on. Actually, you can speak, and then it will... Uh, it will um, my question goes back to the conversation about uh, creating humanitarian space, and so... How do you argue for principles of humanity when there's ingrained cultural dehumanization of the other in the society where you're working? Um, and does this, I think this transcends all the different time periods and I think it's an issue that practically on the ground humanitarian actors face every day. Thank you. And you can also tell us who you would like to ask the question to. Also, and, and if there are questions on the historical periods that we have covered, of course, our, our five panelists can answer. I think it was anyone. I'm sure you're all very well versed in the history of humanitarianism, so I think it's open to anyone. All right, thank you. So, the gentleman here, yes. Yes, uh, Thierry Germon, former ICRC delegate. I have a question for Mr. Morer. Uh, Mr. President, a part of being the president of the ICRC, you are a board member of the World Economic Forum, which, by the way, claims to be neutral, impartial, and independent. <laughs> Knowing that some of the world's major arms industries are members of your organization, World Economic Forum, among others, British Aerospace Systems, look at Martin's Corporation. Do you consider, in regard of the fundamental principles, it is consistent for you to hold these two positions simultaneously? Do you think it is damaging, don't you think it is damaging for the ICRC and for its operational capacity? Or is it what you consider as new partnership? Thank you. 
Thank you. So we have another question here. Yes, it's an improvised question just for not having regrets tomorrow that I didn't raise it. My name is Boris Engelson. I am a local freelance journalist. Some people on earth bet on the worth to come. Jacques Attali, for instance, believed very much that war is unavoidable even in Europe and it will be very bloody. So it is not your role to speak the same as Jacques Attali. But don't you think, do you think that the humanitarian rhetorics contribute to being ready even if the worst comes or does that rhetoric prevent politicians and other decision makers to even confront these kind of scenarios? So I think now I'm <laughs> turning to you. Who would like to take uh, the first question? I don't mind taking the first question. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the first question I think is a is a very fair question, um, and I think it it illustrates actually Peter's point about uh, being clear about the distinction between humanitarian action and those longer term transformational agendas. I mean, the reality is there are some environments where you simply cannot. Uh, operate in the way you would like to because you know that fundamental respect is not there so you have to tackle that in a different way and actually in a way that's what development is all about and that's what um, that's what agencies do uh, um, but they're, but they're not in humanitarian mode they're in they're in sort of longer term developmental mode I think you can do a lot by stealth incidentally I think you know I think I, I, I'm familiar with lots of environments which look very very unpromising um, but if you were subtle about it and if you were patient and if and actually if you relied on dare I say pe fund people's basic humanity which very often transcended their ideology um, you might you were sometimes surprised by the results and just how much you could achieve thank you Peter would like to reply on the question by Thierry Germont yes uh I think uh, in, in today's world uh, of multi-stakeholder decision-making, a humanitarian organization has to define its interface with the others. And the others are other humanitarians, are uh, private, is the private sector, is the United Nations, is intergovernmental organizations, is society, is NGOs. And everybody knows that for principled humanitarianism, this is a delicate issue, how you shape your relationship with the others. I think in a connected world, managing dependency is the best way of ensuring independence. That's what we can realistically do. And managing those dependencies realistically is what, what we do. So. I think it is of critical importance to talk to all stakeholders of uh, conflicts. Uh, uh, I think there are 100 reasons to engage with the private sector on a platform where the private sector meets. Uh, certainly, I think this is compatible to us and as much as we talk to all parties to conflict, it's good to talk to all parties which may fuel conflict or may, pay, may, may make a contribution to de-escalate conflict. So it's uh, of, of the essence of this organization to all those who have any form of influence on the violence and conflicts in which we are either positive or negative, and it is our task to engage with all of them. And then it's a question of op opportunity on where you decide and how exactly you shape that relationship. But uh, if it were not uh, compatible in our view and the view of the assembly of the ICRC, I would not be in the board of the WEF. Thank you. We would like to take the third question, which is actually about the very existence of the humanitarian sector, in fact. Um, yes, Jane? Can I have a first go? Um, does the language of humanitarianism uh, 
allow the rhetoric of the worst case scenario to, to flourish more than it, it does. Um, I doubt it, to be honest, because that humanitarian message is never, don't worry, we've got it covered. Um, it is, it needs to be delivered in absolutely the right way, in a way which taps into that common humanity around the potential humanitarian consequences of particular actions or, or in some cases, lack of action. Um, but I think this is something that the humanitarian community has struggled with for, for, for at least the last couple of decades, which is how to really express that humanitarian voice in the context of, of, of both geopolitical and, and economic arguments. When I say economic, I'm thinking of, you know, the sort of impact of climate change and, and what have you. Um, so I'm very happy to be challenged if you feel that it is actually leaving space for, for people who would, who would put other, things, other actions forward. But personally, I'm, I'm sadly, very sadly sceptical. Thank you. So um, I suggest we take a few more questions. So there is one there. Here, yeah, Mr. Morillon, and another one there. Hi, um, my name is Matthew Hilton from the University of Birmingham. Uh, I have a question about humanity uh, and its meaning. I'm sorry, I hassled Mike over this over dinner last night. Uh, it seems to me that everybody keeps coming back to this notion of humanity as this fundamental thing that exists beyond all of the other principles. And I just wonder whether it's being used as a comforting word to hide and mask over some rather troubling preconceptions uh, we might have in our own approaches as, as to the meaning of humanity. So I think Andrew raised an absolutely fascinating uh, example, which I'm not sure was really addressed. And that's he described it a situation at the moment of decolonization where imperial powers made very deliberate decisions to pass the definition of humanity according to race. We then have a very good example of why Oxfam is proud of itself for denying uh, that attempt to separate two groups within humanity and is rightly proud of some of the work it did in South Africa. What am I, what am I kind of really stunned by is that when you say that in the organization today, what would they do in such a situation? There is a debate. Why is there a debate? Why would anybody want to separate into two distinct groups, humanity along racial lines? So it get, gets back to this more general point about the meaning of humanity and what other preconceptions we might bring to it. And that are we using it to comfort ourselves that we have an underlying principle? That like in today's world, perhaps we need to challenge what we mean by that when we categorize it in other ways, for instance, gender or religion. Thank you. So there is, yes, a question here. Thank you. It's, it's not really a question. It's an endeavor to draw a, a positive conclusion from this debate, uh, uh, which may be your own, but which certainly is mine. Uh, I have always pleaded to make a difference between the principle of humanity, which is embodied in humanitarian action, and the three other main principles, I leave out uh, the smaller principles of, say, namely uh, neutrality, uh, impartiality, and independence. Stressing the fact that indeed it is humanity which is the fundamental principle, and that the other three are just tools to be used, or even possibly not used at times, in order to reach that objective. And I have been very struck by the fact that there seems to be creating a certain consensus 
amongst you uh, to focus on the importance of the principle of humanity and on endeavoring to make it truly universal. Uh, Andrew Thomas' conclusion said, humanity is the paramount principle. Peter Maurer answered, the other side is also human. We need to create the space for a recognition of the principle of humanity. He didn't say of the principles. He said of the principle of humanity. Uh, Sir Michael gave a short answer. It's the humanity, stupid. Reminds me of, the, it's the economy, stupid. You remember? That was many years ago. Um, so, uh, basically, I think that there is a strong consensus on the importance of insisting on the universalization or endeavoring to make universal the principle of humanity and leaving the other principles at their proper level, which is one or two spaces below, namely tools in order to reach that objective. Thank you. I think we have, we have a dialogue on, on, on this principle of, on, of humanity uh, starting in the room. Uh, Cornelius Somaruga. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. I am Cornelius Somaruga and was almost 13 years president of the ICRC. Uh, I would like uh, not to enter into philosophy, uh, but just say some points as to the way in which uh, I approached uh, uh, my mission, uh, taking into account the uh, fundamental principles. And I must uh, somewhat contradict to my friend Jacques Morillon that just spoke when he said uh, there is one fundamental principle and the others, uh, uh, independence, neutrality, impartiality, as coming afterwards. Uh, it would have been impossible for me to act as president of the ICRC, if I would not have uh, always shown strong adherence to independence, particularly independence, neutrality, and also impartiality. And this uh, fact of independence went so far that I was invited several times to participate in certain gremia, and I always refused. I didn't go to the assembly of the ICRC to ask if I could do that because anyhow the assembly was always rather weak and would not have dared to say to the president, do not do uh, <laughs> such a thing. But indeed, I even resigned the day when I was appointed uh, uh, as ICRC president, resigned from a board of a family foundation in order to be completely independent. When speaking about independence, my second point is the question of national societies that have to uh, follow all these principles, as it is said in the movement uh, statutes. And this was a fight, a continuous fight of all kinds of national societies, the confusion that uh, being uh, the, uh, uh, I don't remember the, the term, but uh, helping uh, public services uh, and keeping the independence was a certain contradiction. But this contradiction brought very often as national societies to lose their uh, not only independence, but also their neutrality. And this was one of my major points each time I had uh, somebody uh, to talk with in high positions of national societies, I had to recall the importance of independence, but not only to them, but also to the governments, because the governments have also adhered to the fundamental principles of the Red Cross, Red Cross. Third point, landmines. I think that uh, my friend uh, Peter Maurer 
said something important about the proximity that uh, the Red Cross delegate, and I would say also the president, has to have. And the landmines problem has been, for me, a tremendous shock because of the proximity to the victims and to de delegates giving assistance to these victims. And I tried first to push the ICRC to engage strongly in one movement of the United Nations uh, in the CCW frame, but uh, because of the rule of uh, uh, unanimity that was taken by the uh, disarmament conference, there was never the possibility to go up to the total ban of landmines. And this is why, at a certain moment, I took my independence. My independence was also in respect of many of my fellow uh, collaborators in the ICRC that didn't like my uh, push in the direction of the total ban. And I made this proclamation 94 asking for a total ban. Um, our doctors, our nurses were very satisfied. Our lawyers thought uh, that this was not really the task of the president of the ICRC. But what it was my uh, fundamental point? First, humanity. The principles of humanity <laughs> told me you have to act because you have to see what happens in the world. And secondly, international humanitarian law. Protocol additional number one the famous provision, I don't remember the number of the article, of Cyrus, serious injuries and unnecessary suffering, that one should prevent that, should also prevent that weapons would be developed in this sense. And I thought it was my uh, responsibility to go out and I had a fantastic instrument, what was more efficient than the one of the ICBL uh, of Jordi Williams. I had the whole movement of the Red Cross and Red Crescent that had to follow us. I, I hope so. Uh, there was then a problem of independence with some uh, national societies of uh, big powers that didn't dare to say that one should follow the total ban. But I am happy that finally, the ICRC was uh, probably the main element of reaching the Ottawa Convention on the total ban on antipersonal mines. Thank you. Thank you very much. So who would like to uh, comment or reply? Well, I can maybe, on the basis of some of the questions which were asked now, a little bit sharpen and differentiate what uh, uh, one or two points again. Uh, I think this meeting and the papers and the discussion this evening has shown that each and every period of history has a different pondering on which one of the principle uh, is the most important one and is relevant to solve some of the problems with which the organization is confronted. Having said that, Jack, I would agree with you that in terms of the character of what the four mean, the principle of humanity has another dimension than the three others. It doesn't mean that the three others are not perfectly valuable and utterly important in certain circumstances, but the reason why we are somehow expressing ourselves this way is that there is a genuine concern of the humanitarian community and its different expression here that we are basically at the brink of a sinkhole and that spaces are shrinking, and that consensus around what humanity means are to be reconstituted as we have a highly diversified and atomized world in which we are dealing and conflict environment with which we are dealing. And there I would go to the first question. Of course, the importance of such a meeting and such uh, also a historical perspective is to recognize all the biases which have taken place in the past in, in, the, in interpreting uh, the, the principles of 
uh, the, the humanitarian principles and the fundamental principles that we are, were discussing this evening. And then also to, to see what are the communalities today which are behind the principle of humanity. And here again I would uh, just end with a notion of optimism. When I look on our engagement, even with parties to conflict, hugely separated, at the end of the day, they know that detainees have to be treated humanely and not tortured. They know that women, children, and soldiers out of combat deserve special protection. They know that illegal weapons must not be used. They know that there is a principle of distinction between civilians and militaries. A lot is known which is in support of a space of humanity. And in that sense, uh, uh, I, I have certainly not given up, and I think it is important to learn from the biases, but at the same time also to explore, explicit, make clearer what the meaning of the principle is, and I would agree that in today's situation, the principle of humanity has a, in, in my sense, a higher priority of significance than the other principles which are more instrumental but as important. For me, the second one would be impartiality today. Because of what I have described beforehand, impartiality is at stake as much as humanity uh, uh, at the present moment. We, we're running out of time, but I would like to give you the opportunity to have your own concluding remarks. Uh, so maybe each of you could take uh, a minute, but first, Andrew. Yes, if I'd like to try and respond to the, the first question, which was about um, fundamental principles and whether they can transcend cultural differences. And to connect that with Matthew Hilton's question about the relationship between fundamental principles and racism under decolonization. And I'd like to try and respond by giving a historian's answer, which is to actually compare what happened in the 1960s and 70s to international law and to the fundamental principles. So I think there was a substantive debate over international law. Once those nearly and newly independent African and Asian states had had self-determination recognized as a human right in the UN. Once they'd taken the language of human rights into economic justice and development aid, the next target was the additional protocols and to have wars against um, colonialist, uh, racist and alien regimes recognized as international armed conflict. I don't think, I think the fundamental principles were, were different. I don't think there was an attempt by the non-aligned movement to affect a substantive revision. In fact, you might say the substantive revision or the effort uh, to make one came from an entirely different quarter in 1961 before the Vienna Conference when the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc states tried unsuccessfully to have peacekeeping and disarmament included in the fundamental principles. For me, the issue for the fundamental principles for nearly and newly independent African and Asian states was a rhetoric and a reality issue. And if you look at the experience of um, national societies um, in Africa and Asia that were um, part of either the French Empire, the Portuguese Empire, the British Empire, or the Belgian Empire, the real problem was um, a, a critic, the criticism from liberation movements was that actually platitudes were, were mouthed towards the fundamental principles. There was a rhetoric, but that rhetoric was completely belied by the reality of how those societies actually behaved and what they did, uh, and the fact that they were, um, uh, didn't behave at all in a neutral, impartial, or independent way. Thank you, Andrew. Jane would like to conclude. Maybe what, mm. maybe the, you could uh, answer to the question: What lessons you you draw from from history, or what the lessons that uh, you draw from this discussion, at least? <laughs> um, and I will also, in so doing, answer the Oxfam yes. point as well, because I clearly didn't make it um, clearly. Um, the 
value of the fundamental principles as a language, but an evolving framework for the increasing levels of humanitarian crisis and humanitarian need, I don't think has ever been more important. And I think that critical need to continue wrestling and evolving within the fundamental principles is absolutely crucial. How we actually express those and how we find new but effective ways of demonstrating that I think is the real challenge. And what I'm saying about Oxfam in South Africa is absolutely fundamentally not that we have let go of humanity, not at all, but faced with similar challenges, and we are everywhere, and I'm very proud of a lot of our work on that. We would simply do it in a different way, <coughs> that the, the solidarity of the 60s and 70s is not the most effective way in the current environment. And so it's that evolution within the framework is what I take away. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Um, now I would like to add to this uh, discussion and, and conclude. Professor Aman would like to... Um, maybe I would like to stress uh, three points that were, were inspired by this discussion and by the conference as a whole. Uh, the first one was inspired by Peter Maurer, uh, who told us that in order to be effective, principles shouldn't be dogmatic, but pragmatic. And I think it's very nice to hear. <laughs> and the second one is inspi inspired by Jane Cooking. And uh, I, it, it was very pleasant for me as a historian to hear that you can choose between a past that is a burden or a past that is a pleasant blessing. And I hope that this conference will, ha will help us to see the past as a blessing or as a source of inspiration. And the third point is inspired by the fact that you organized this conference because, uh, in my opinion, uh, principles not only reflect the evolution of warfare or victimhood, but also uh, reflect all the, the world of the people who are enunciating these principles. So why are we now, today, reflecting on these principles? I guess it's a big question. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mike? Well, uh, I'd like to use my last word just to say one more thing about about humanity and in response to Matthew's question. The reason I think it's important to assert that principle is that it is threatened. We live in an age where it is under threat. We live in an age, let me remind you, of turkey shoots. We li live in an age of bug splats. We live in an age of targeted killings uh, as, a, as, a, as a weapon of war. Um, and I think it's all too easy to slip into a mode where we do not value all human life equally. Um, and therefore, the principle of humanity is fundamental. For me, I can't separate it from the principle of impartiality, I have to say. I think the two are completely interconnected. Uh, but my final point is, maybe if you wanted to do something really radical, um, it might be worth re-examining whether it's really most efficacious to have all those principles in the same basket as they are, as they have been since 65. Because for me, there's a, you know, there is a hierarchy. Um, they serve a different purpose. Again, language is interesting. For me, it's more about values than principles. You know, principles are how you, things that you, tr you, you try to, they're more operational. They're, they're how we do things. Values are about what we really believe in. And I think it, maybe it's worth putting some effort into trying to be very, very clear about the fundamental values that are immutable and, you know, w without which we would not be here at all, and some principles that will vary over time. So things like, you know, unity and universality, I mean, I can understand why they're important in a Red Cross context. They're not quite in the same league, I think, as some of the other principles. So y you might actually, if you've wanted to be really brave, 
just see whether a bit of reordering in the basket would be, would be helpful and would help to assert this fundamental principle of humanity more, more efficaciously. Can I just say one sentence in, uh, in a sense that uh, of what Mike said, we are organizing uh, the week after next in New York a side event at the opening of the General Assembly of the UN under the title Reuniting Around the Principle of Humanity. Uh, just, it's not as brave as you may expect, <laughs> but it's as brave as it gets. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So that was the final word. Uh, thank you all. Our conference on history continues tomorrow with the 40 experts who came for this. You can also find more information on our, our next events, uh, public events here on this leaflet. Uh, but uh, before the next event and before the conference tomorrow, uh, we invite you to join us for refreshments uh, upstairs in the restaurant of the ICRC. Some colleagues will show you the way. So thank you all and good evening. Bravo. <laughs>